Does anybody want to share anything that you wrote down? You can just kind of shout it out. Absorption. Absorption. Okay. Anything else about digestion? Yes. Starts in the mouth. Okay. Starts in the yeah. mouth. Yeah. Chewing well. Chewing well. <laughs> Great. So this process and the nutrients absorbed in the mostly small intestine, but some in the large intestine also. Good. Yeah. Most of the chew in there. All right. Okay. So there's like all different knowledge. There's a bunch of different knowledge here, which is great. All right. So now we are going to do a little recap. Uh, and we're going to show you guys a movie about digestion and how it happens. And a little kind of overview of the anatomy of the digestion system. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to my podcast on the digestive system. One of my favorite animals is the flesh fly. The flesh fly that ooze from carrion, it then creates a little bubble that evaporates so it can leave the material behind because there's so much fluid inside here. And so the flesh fly is an example of a fluid feeder and it's kind of a unique way of feeding. We also have suspension feeders. An example would be like a blue whale taking in a bunch of ocean water, squirting the water out and then using baleen to hold the krill behind it. Or a substrate feeder like a, uh, a caterpillar that lives within the substrate of a leaf. But most of us are bulk feeders. That means that we take our food in in bulk and then we have to digest it and then eventually absorb it into our body. And so I wanted to start with a picture of a donut. The reason why is it starts you salivating because you might want to eat a donut, but it also has a hole in it. And if you were to stick your finger through the hole in a donut, that's a lot like food moving through the hole that is your digestive system. In other words, it's gonna move all the way from your mouth out your anus, but it's not really inside you. When you stick your finger through the hole of a donut, it's not technically inside the donut. Just like the food that goes through your digestive system is not technically inside your body. It's just moving through a hole in your body. We can eventually absorb that material inside our body, but not until it gets very small. And so you are what you eat. What does that mean? Well, there are basically four types of macromolecules that make up life, from carbohydrates to nucleic acids. And so you're going to take food like this pizza, you're going to break that polymers down into tiny little monomers, and then you're going to weave that back into you. So when you look at me right now, what you're really seeing is protein that was in food I ate weeks or months ago. And so a good way to see if you understand the digestive system is if we're, we're done with this podcast, I'm going to show this pizza again, could you review each of these four major macromolecules from carbohydrates to proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, where it's digested. And if you have an understanding of where and how it's digested, then you really understand what's going on. But the whole thing begins with our Pavlovian response. And this was a Russian scientist who used dogs. He measured the amount of saliva they had. There was a bell that he would ring. But basically, he conditioned them so that when they, he rang the bell, they'd start to salivate. And the same thing works with us. Um, there's a great episode of The Office where Jim gets Dwight to uh, Pavlovian respond to a little uh, ringing of a bell in a mint. So you may want to watch that. So basically when we see it, we start to salivate. We have glands, three big glands that are going to produce saliva and those are going to empty into our mouth. Now the saliva has water in it, but it mostly has mucus and then an enzyme called amylase. And amylase breaks down starch, amylose starch, and so it's going to break down or start the breakdown of that carbohydrate. And so basically our teeth are there to chew up that bulk food, our tongue is there to move it back to the teeth, but eventually we're going to form a bolus and that bolus is going to move down our esophagus. Now, right here we have an epiglottis that will close because we don't want our food to go into our trachea and into our lungs. And so if you swallow, right now you can actually feel that epiglottis moving as we as we uh, slide that food down into our esophagus we have control up here but eventually moves into smooth muscle eventually ends up in the stomach so what's going on in the stomach well we'll have a sphincter right here which closes it off and a sphincter right here and so the food will sit inside our stomach we're going to break it down chemically and mechanically there are a series of muscles that go this way muscles that go this way and muscles that go this way and basically they're going to churn up your food and if there's nothing inside there you can hear that your stomach growling as it tries to grind up nothing um, so basically that's mechanical digestion we will sit there for minutes if not hours grinding up the food but we also have chemical digestion here and there are two chemical or two cells that you could, should remember 
Those are the chief cells and the parietal cells. Basically, they're going to be cells in the lining of the stomach. We also produce mucus because we don't want to digest the stomach itself, so there's going to be mucus here. But the two things that are produced are hydrochloric acid. Those are going to be produced by the parietal cells. So hydrochloric acid is going to move out here. The function of that isn't to digest the food. It's to create an acidic environment where the other chemical, which is called pepsin, can start to break down proteins. And so protein digestion starts to occur right here in the stomach as we start to unravel those big proteins into single um, strands of uh, amino acids that we can eventually break down in the duodenum. Okay, so that's the stomach. Um, next we move into the duodenum. Duodenum is gonna be this first portion of the small intestine. Um, there are a few important things that connect here. Um, the first one is gonna be the gallbladder, and then we're gonna have this bile duct that'll empty down into the duodenum. What does that contain? It contains bile salts. Bile salts are important because if you've ever tried to mix fat with water or oil with water, since it's hydrophobic, you can't break it down. And so the nice thing about these bile salts is that um, they will actually surround the lipids, make them much smaller so they emulsify the fat, and so we can start breaking that down. Okay, so that's going to be important. Next, we have a bunch of enzymes that come, oops, let me go back, a bunch of enzymes that come out of the pancreas. So the pancreas is important because, remember, it can regulate blood sugar, but it's also produced, it's a gland, it's producing all of these enzymes. And so lipases are going to come into the duodenum, and those are going to break down lipids. Pancreatic amylase is going to be important because it's going to break down carbohydrates. We also have trypsin and chymotrypsin. Those are going to break down different types of amino acids or breaks between different types of amino acids, so we can break down those uh, proteins into the building blocks. And we also have nucleases that are going to be produced in the pancreas as well. And so we have tons of enzymes that are produced by the pancreas, and they're going to break down the uh, different uh, bulk food as it comes into our body. Next we move and continue down the small intestine into the jejunum and the ileum. And so if we kind of follow, so this would be the duodenum, and now if we follow food, it's going to kind of move almost like a maze all the way through our small intestine. This first section is called the jejunum. Basically what happens in here is we're going to finish digesting the food, and then we're going to start absorbing the food. How does that work? Well, if these are the lining of the small intestine, we have these villi and microvilli. They're going to be capillaries that move in here and basically move out, and they're going to take the nutrients into our body. How do we get those nutrients into, uh, into our body? Well, some of it's diffusion, but a lot of it is active transport, actively moving that material in. And so by the time we get down to the end of that ileum, we've pretty much digested and absorbed most of the food that we need to take in. In fact, we're not going to do much more digestion of those, uh, those monomers as we move into the large intestine. So what's it do? Well, it's called the colon. It's got three different types to it. It's got the ascending, transverse, and descending colon. But basically, as our waste moves through the colon or the large intestine, we're reclaiming water from our waste. And also, there are a bunch of bacteria that live in here, and they can release uh, vitamins from our food, so we can get that as well. And it's important that we have there. Um, this is one thing that I didn't mention. This is the appendix. The appendix is actually a vestigial structure. It has a bunch of bacteria in it. Sometimes it becomes inflamed, and that's a big deal, because if we release those bacteria into our body, we're in trouble. It doesn't really do anything, but if we look at certain animals like... Uh, a koala bear, for example, their appendix or their cecum is this really large kind of a thing that looks like this. And so basically what happens is the leaves will get pushed down in here and bacteria are going to help them break that down. But since we don't eat a lot of that, it's not required. And so let's see how well you did. Could... All right, so we're going to do our own review. So one thing I really wanted to emphasize is that when fruit food is brought into the digestive system from like into the body from the digestive system, it's broken down to really, really small molecules. Like you wouldn't be able to recognize it anymore. So after it's absorbed by the cells, it then goes into the portal vein and to the, and then to the liver and then from there out to the rest of the body. So I have some questions. So if you have the answer, just raise your hand. Um, so where does carbohydrate digestion begin? Yeah, in the mouth. In the mouth, perfect. Oh, 
I do the prime of the lipid. Okay, perfect. All right, so where else is carbohydrates digested, digested after the mouth? Yeah. The jejunum. So the small intestine is perfect. So and that's digested by amylase. So where are proteins, where are proteins started to be like broken down and where are they digested? Like where are they absorbed? Anybody remember that one? Yes. Stored in like where it's pepsin in the stomach. Okay. Okay, so it starts in the stomach. Yeah. And then it continues on to in the small intestine. So yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, so where is fat digested? Yes. In the duodenum. Yes, in the small intestines. And it's digested by light pieces. All right, this is a fill in the blank question. So, some people may be surprised that some, vitamin, some vitamins are absorbed by the blank. Colon. Oh, perfect. Put it right back there. Okay. And the last question is what gland produces enzymes that aids our small intestines with digestion? Oh, you already got one, so I'm not going to call on you again. And she was a for the zippy. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yes. <coughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Make one so first. Yeah. I'm going to be talking to you about a few daily habits that support healthy digestion. But first, we're going to uh, hand out some crackers just for a little activity. So try not to eat them yet. Just hold on. Mm -hmm. So take take one and pass it around. So I'll just come around slowly. So one of the simplest and most often overlooked uh, ways to support your digestion is to chew your food thoroughly. Digestion begins in the mouth with enzymes in your saliva, and the process of chewing mechanically breaks down the food. So when you eat too fast or don't chew thoroughly, your stomach has to do the rest of the work, which puts unnecessary strain on your digestive tract. Food fragments from improperly chewed food that are too big can be uh, to be broken down, end up as fodder for bacteria in your large uh, intestine, which can cause uh, bacterial overgrowth, which can lead to gas and other unpleasant symptoms. Sorry. So the act of chewing also triggers the rest of the digestive process. Eating slower and chewing thoroughly sends signals to your uh, digestive organs. The stimulation of taste receptors actually stimulates your stomach to release acid. Chewing also stimulates your pancreas to secrete more enzymes and digestive juice. A good rule of thumb is to I hear crunching. <laughs> a good rule of thumb is to chew the food until you can still tell what it is by taste, but not by texture. So this is a final exercise. Okay, so everybody just take your cracker and then take a bite. And I want everybody just to focus for the next 10 seconds on chewing. Just chew it thoroughly, just focus on the cracker, and just kind of taste it, and just think about it and chew it. feel for everybody. Is that kind of strange to just sit there and think about it? Is it kind of yeah. Yeah. weird? Yeah. It is, because weird. I think most of the time when we eat, we're, you know, we take, you chew two or three times and you swallow. Like you just want to get food in your stomach as fast as possible. So, but mindful eating, I think definitely, and being aware of the food you're eating can definitely contribute to good digestion. It's much more of, uh, it's much more of a sensory uh, experience. Yes, completely. I mean, I think you definitely enjoy your food more. And you can actually taste it, because you're wolfing down your food, you're not really tasting it, you're just kind of refueling, so to speak. Okay. So fiber is another component of healthy digestion. There's two types of fiber, insoluble and soluble. So insoluble fiber helps prevent constipation by adding bulk to the stool and keeps food moving through the digestive tract. Soluble fiber <laughs> attracts water during digestion and turns into a gel, which uh, slows down digestion and keeps you full longer. Soluble fiber is found in oatmeal, barley, nuts, seeds, fruit, and vegetables, and then uh, soluble, insoluble fi fiber, I'm sorry, is actually called roughage, and it's found in wheat bran, whole grains, and vegetables. The average American gets about 15 grams of fiber per day, but guidelines suggest that men need about 38 grams of fiber per day, and women need about uh, 25 grams of fiber per day. So when adding fiber to your diet, it's really important to start adding it gradually to minimize GI distress. So you know, add fiber gradually and increase it to about 25 to 35 grams per day is what you're consuming. I 
just want to note, though, that fiber's benefits aren't confined to di digestive health. Studies have found that fiber can help lower cholesterol, it can promote healthy blood sugar levels, reduce cardiovascular disease, and help people lose weight and maintain a healthy body weight. So stress reduction. Stress can affect every part of the dig digestive system. Stress activates a flight or fight response in the central nervous system, which slows down uh, blood flow to your digestive tract, which affects the contractions of your digestive muscles and decreases secretions needed for digestion. Stress can cause inflammation in your digestive system and make you more susceptible to infection as well. So there's a couple ways to reduce stress. <laughs> One of the simplest and most effective ways is just to get regular exercise. Physical activity relieves tension and stimulates the release of brain chemicals called endorphins, which relieve stress and improve your mood. Another uh, way is relaxation therapy, so yoga, meditation, biofeedback, progressive muscle relaxation, even listening to music can be beneficial for stress reduction. Talk therapy is another way, so talk therapy can just be talking to your friends and family about what's stressing you, and also working with a professional. A study that was a uh, Studying uh, people who suffered from irritable bowel syndrome found that 70% of them actually found relief from their symptoms after 12 weeks of working with a therapist. So actually eating foods that are bad for your digestion can also cause stress. So really try to avoid extremes of sugar, alcohol, or fat. Smoking and excess caffeine can also uh, contribute to stress, especially in the digestive tract. So healthy digestion also requires adequate fluid. When you don't drink enough water, the colon reabsor reabsorbs more water from the stool, which leads to constipation. Drinking plenty of water helps you stay hydrated, so the colon doesn't need to extract as much water from the stool. As a result, stools are softer and just easier to eliminate. According to the Institute of, Institute of Medicine, um, men need about 13 cups of water a day, and women need about 9 cups of water a day. And I know that seems like a lot, but I think it's a good thing to remember that about 20% of your uh, uh, fluid intake comes from the food you eat. So a good way to increase your water consumption is just to eat more fruits and vegetables, because they're about 90% water. And finally, exercise. A regular exercise regime supports healthy digestion, <coughs> along with decreasing stress. Exercise can improve the efficiency of the digestive tract. Exercise is key for our regular bowel movements. In fact, one of the biggest risk factors for constipation is physical inactivity or sedentary lifestyle. Exercise improves the elimination of waste by decreasing the amount of time it takes food to move through your large intestine. Aerobic exercise also accelerates breathing and heart rate, which stimulates the natural contraction of intestinal muscles. Intestinal muscles that contract efficiently help move the stools out faster. Cardiovascular exercise also strengthens the muscles of the abdomen, which stimulates the intestinal muscles to <laughs> through the digestive tract quickly again. So you should really avoid vigorous exercise after a meal, but simply uh, just getting up and moving can be beneficial. So simple things like uh, 10 to 15 minutes of walking several times a day can be beneficial. Also um, low impact exercises such as yoga, uh, bike riding, or Pilates can really improve digestion. So, so you talked about all the um, good habits that can support your uh, digestive system. And uh, another really good way to support the GI function is to uh, take care of your good bacteria in your gut. So I'm just going to quiz you guys really quick. Um, so just kind of to uh, think about the video we watched earlier, do you remember where those bacteria are found? Can you point it out from this picture where the bacteria are found in your body? Large intestines. Large intestines, which would be? In the heart. Those are right here? Yeah. Okay, that's good. So I'll make sure that you guys have, you are paying attention to the video that we showed earlier. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's like where we found our bacteria, and we know it's, they are important for us, and like there are so many benefits of them. So I'm gonna be talking about like benefits of probiotics, and then why are they so important to us? So what does um, product probiotics probiotics really means? 
So it's such a, here's a definition I found. Um, it's actually put, to, put together by like expertise from World Health Organization. So, um, and the probiotic is actually der derived from Greek word, and this is how it looks like. If anyone learned Greek, they can probably read this, but I never learned it, so I don't really know how you said it. But it literally means cool life. So kind of just based on the, um, the meaning of probiotics, we can just assume that it should be good for us, right? Anyone? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so can anyone think of any benefits of probiotics or any benefit of maintaining a good bacteria in your gut? Disease prevention. It's what, sorry? Disease prevention. Disease prevention. You digest your food better with a probiotic. Yeah. It's easier to digest. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a good way. Yes. Any other? Anyone else? Okay, no? Anyway, okay, so move on to the next slide. We're gonna talk about benefit of uh, probiotics. Um, so we all know that probiotics are found in our colon, and what's the major function of your colon? Function of your waste. gut. What do you Eliminate do every waste. day? Eliminate waste. Yes. Mm -hmm. And absorb water. Absorb it, water. Yeah. You're absorbing water and eliminating everything exactly. else. So yeah, we are trying to get the uh, waste product out of the body, and that's being done by uh, colon. So it's really important that we have this regular bowel movement every day, right? So luckily, <laughs> probiotics can help us with that. It can actually uh, help with diarrhea, especially viral diarrhea and the antibiotic-associated <laughs> diarrhea. And as you know, we are using a lot of antibiotics in this country. So this is a good thing to know that probiotics can benefit that. And probiotics can also help with constipation. And one of the studies I was reading about as I was doing research on the probiotics, they uh, actually said, uh, found that people who are consuming more probiotic-rich food have less smelly stool. So it's good to know if you're sharing factor with someone else or you have roommates. I mean, in case, I'm not saying that you're so smell rude, but just uh, keep this in mind, right? So second benefit of probiotics, um, I'll go to the next one, so uh, is to normalize the GI health. So there's like three different ways I'm gonna be talking more into detail about that the probiotics can help you to normalize your GI function. So the first one is it can reduce the production and accumulation of toxin. Uh, we all eat food every day, like you eat protein <coughs> and you have like donuts and you broccoli every day. Probably not broccoli every day, but uh, my point is that you do eat food every day. And at the same time your body is breaking down the food, it's also producing some toxin. And those toxins, if you think about this, pic looking at this picture, and thinking those red dots are the toxin, it could potentially enter your bloodstream and creating some damage. So probiotics can actually help to lower those uh, the toxic level of the toxin and also reduce the production. So that gives us a more excuse to eat your yogurt in the morning. And the second, ben uh, the second way that probiotics <coughs> help us to normalize GI function is to fight against those uh, bad bacteria, which here I refer as disease-causing bacteria. So I'm gonna move to the next slide. So this is just a picture to show you how uh, probiotics works. So thinking about those probiotics, uh, the blue thing is the probiotics, and those pink cloudy thing are the um, bad one. So your probiotics can actually shoot the bullets to the um, bad bacteria, or they can like, fight the right with them, just kind of to get them out of your system, or your probiotics can actually release some kind of sub substance and to neutralize the toxin they are produced from, from the uh, bad bacteria. So it's just amazing that probiotics are doing so much stuff to your body. And then thirdly, uh, probiotics can also battle with H. pylori, 
Does everyone know what H. pylori is? No? Yes? I see like some naughty and some nose. Yes? I think it's a virus in the stomach. Uh huh. So it's actually a bacteria. And oh, it's a bacteria? It's a bacteria. And 75% um, of Americans have it, but not everyone has the symptoms. So H. pylori is actually uh, the major cause of stomach ulcers, um, which I think a lot of people are struggling with. So what probiotics can do to H. pylori is um, it can actually stop the H. pylori from sticking to your stomach wall. And you know, once H. pylori uh, stick to your stomach wall, that's when they start causing those trouble and damage to your stomach. So probiotics can actually stop that process right there and to prevent the uh, further damage. So just I mean, really good information to know that like being nice to your back, uh, bacteria, it's uh, really good for your personal health. And the third benefit of probiotics um, is, go ahead. So probiotics can actually enhance digestibility of nutrients and increase nutrient value. I think one of, did you mention that earlier? So yeah, very good job on like speaking that one out because not many people actually are aware of that. So probiotics can actually improve lactose digestion. Um, you know how a lot of people are suffering from lactose intolerance and uh, especially in Asian group, like I guess a lot of Asian are not, they don't have the enzyme to break down the lactose. So the probiotics do is they can break down the lactose for you and then so your body don't have to do that. So it's a the process for you. And the probiotic can also increase the absorption of minerals, especially calcium and magnesium. And uh, the third ability of probiotics is that you can synthesize vitamin B vitamins and vitamin K. And guess who gets the benefit? Like we get the benefit of all the nutrients and the minerals they are being released from the probiotics or being synthesized from the probiotics. So I guess with all this benefit of probiotics, I mean, it just makes sense to eat more of them, right? So I'm gonna uh, give Megan this. Megan is gonna talk about, yes? Hey, I just want to put on that. Um, on the absorption, of making making it better to absorb, better absorption of the minerals and, and mm -hmm. the calcium and everything. Is that better absorption than in the in, uh, small intestine? Or is where is the probiotic actually working to increase the absorption? It's actually working in the large intestine. In the large intestine. Yeah, because I know most of the minerals and calcium or nutrients are being absor absorbed in the small intestine, but they are also being absorbed in the large in intestine large. as well. And uh, we can talk more about it if you have more questions, because we do have more questions and asking at the end of the session. And Megan is going to talk about where you can get the probiotic from and some recipe of how to make fermented food. Okay, great. I get the fun part. I get to talk about the food up here. That was intentional. Um, <laughs> so at past year, Lily's talked about all these great benefits of probiotics. And if it seems like we're kind of focusing in on that, it's because, honestly, it's probably the biggest area of research and nutrition right now. And some of the things that they're finding are very exciting discoveries. So Lily talked about the great benefits, but we really like to practice whole foods nutrition. So you can definitely get probiotics from supplements, but the benefit of giving, getting it from food is that one, you're eating food anyway. You're getting energy from the food, and it's also providing you with vitamins and minerals, and depending on what you're eating, probably antioxidants and phytochemicals as well. So definitely you get a lot of benefits from eating probiotic foods as opposed to just taking a supplement. Um, so what are some probiotic foods that you can include in your diet? Go ahead and shout them out. Yogurt. Sauerkraut. Yogurt. That's definitely Sauerkraut. 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 Yeah. Great. Kimchi. Kimchi. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Miso. Miso. Perfect. Lots of different good sources here. And I do want to mention in this section, I'm going to be using the terms fermented foods and probiotics interchangeably. So what's the difference? They're both microorganisms. Really, the biggest difference is that with probiotics, we have um, 
done clinical trials and can kind of say this strain in particular does this. So, you know, the researchers look at different strains and as Lily was saying, they choose to study ones that specifically um, adhere to cell walls better than bacteria to outcompete that bacteria. And they'll also, um, you know, produce a certain amount of acid to change the uh, acid in your intestines and thusly kill pathogens so pathogens can survive. So basically, they do have the same benefits, but fermented foods um, just might have different strains of bacteria that aren't quite as well studied by science, but still have the same um, benefits there. Um, so history of fermented foods. Um, looking into this is really interesting. So cultures have been fermenting foods for thousands of years. Couple stats down here. Mesopotamia winemaking goes back to at least 6,000 BC. Fermented beverages, in particular, are really the first things that started being made, and then fermented milk as well was definitely a common touchstone between cultures. And leavened bread was found in Egypt in 1500 BC. So this was done by ancient people to preserve foods. That was really kind of the first way that it was used um, to preserve things like vegetables. As well, and then also to enhance the digestibility and the flavor of the foods. And I think what's so interesting and what's so um, kind of key about this is that they're found all over the world in ancient times at a time when cultures were not communicating with each other. People in Egypt were not Googling what South Americans were, were making. So um, they really have a lot of historical and cultural significance, which is very interesting now that it's becoming an integral part of our diet again. Okay, so fermented foods, as I said, can be found all over the world across cultures. Um, just a couple quick examples here. In Japan, um, cement, and throughout Asia, fermenting soybeans is a very big thing, as well as different fermented um, pickles. And somebody mentioned kimchi, that's you know a huge cultural touchstone in Korea. It's traditionally done underground in a crop and has a lot of significance. I know it's served with most meals. Um, in Indonesia, soybeans are fermented into tempeh, and that was actually introduced um, by the Chinese thousands of years ago, which is really neat. Um, in sour, in Europe, I found uh, there was a written record of sauerkraut in Germany in 1607, so a lot of history with that as well. In Peru, they ferment something called chicha. It's a very ceremonial drink. It's made out of corn, and they actually pre-chew it and then spit it out, um, and then it's fermented and it's used as used ceremonially. Um, and it's still done today. Okay. So, how do foods become fermented? Uh, basically, it's they're fermented by different types of organisms. The most common organisms are ones that produce lactic acid or yeast. So the lactic acid producing obviously produce the acids, um, and then uh, yeast would produce carbon dioxide, and that's what gives us the bubbles in um, things like sourdough or things like beer. Uh, organisms need carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen for fermentation. Um, a lot of fermentation is done aerobically in the presence of oxygen, even when it's done anaerobically, without oxygen, there's still a tiny bit that's needed at the substrate level to be taken up and get that reaction going. Um, so basically, the yeasts kind of eat the food themselves, typically the carbohydrate, and then produce the acid and the uh, carbon dioxide as they're fermenting the food. So the environment in which foods are fermented makes a huge difference. Again, there are a lot of different kinds of bacteria, so some will do better and flourish in a hotter environment, and some will do better in a cooler environment. But there's typically a range at which they can operate, and outside of that, they'll die. This is a living organism. They also need cofactors and enzymes. That varies with each different type of organism to exactly what kind of cofactors and enzymes they need, but typically it's a lot of different minerals as well as B vitamins. B vitamins are hugely important to this process. And then uh, the culture, so
So things can be fermented using bacteria either in the environment or bacteria that naturally exists on the vegetables or fruits themselves. But a, a starter culture can also be used. So you can like inoculate food with something to make it begin fermenting. Um, and, you know, a really good example of this would be a sourdough starter. Those are passed around and that is used to kind of seed a new dough and start that fermentation process. So one thing that I would like to mention is probiotic and fermented foods are really healthy and for a normal healthy person with a good immune system, it's a fantastic idea. But there are definitely populations that should not be consuming, especially um, things that are fermented at home because uh, they're immune compromised and they can't necessarily handle the introduction of that bacteria. Even though it does wonderful things, it can be um, you know, harmful when someone has a very suppressed immune function and a really limited number of antibodies. So who, you know, who are we talking about here? Patients with cancer and HIV or AIDS are typically immune suppressed. And then some different life cycle stages as well. Pregnant women should not be consuming fermented foods, um, as well as very young children and elderly people that are immune suppressed. So, excuse me, what is elderly? What do you think? That's a great question. Um, as far as the immune benefits, I would say, I don't like. Amy, do you have a good guess? A good rule of thumb? Um, and it, yeah, and it also depends on sort of what we would consider healthy, elderly, or someone who maybe is not as healthy. So someone who might be in a nursing home or has some some other concerns happening. That Often like do. another disease yes. state or other um, things going on in this well. I would say kind of a good rule of thumb, that's the age where you kind of want to start being careful. <laughs> that doesn't mean like no, but you might like think twice about trying something that your cousin fermented in her basement. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there are fermented foods that are sold commercially and probiotic foods are becoming more and more popular. And yeah, unless you know you have some serious immune issues or diseases, you should be fine with those. All right, and some ways to incorporate fermented foods into your diet. So I, I like to think of a balanced meal as containing a digestive. Um, that could be something that's raw or fermented. Personally, I prefer fermented products, but if we think about what they do, so the, you know, a lot of these produce lactic acid, that's an acid, and it's, they're typically sour. So it's going to actually stimulate the bile flow and stimulate digestive enzymes just by having that fermented sour food. And eating that with a meal is a really great way to assist with digestion. So drink it in a beverage. We're gonna be sampling some kefir and kombucha back here in a little bit, so you can try those out. Um, you, I love to make smoothies with kefir, and you can also do it with yogurt, so that's a great way to get, smooth, uh, to get probiotics in, especially in a hurry in the morning. And adding it as a condiment or a sauce. Um, a really good yogurt or cultured sour cream goes well on a lot of different foods. And the thing that I love most about plain yogurt, um, especially some really good Greek stuff, or like I love the Nancy's, which has a lot of um, colony forming units, is that you can make it into a sauce that has any kind of flavor. You can make it kind of sweet, savory. I mean, you can really do anything. It's a blank canvas. So that's a great way to add um, uh, fermented Except food. You can't heat it. You have, you have to be careful not that's to heat right. it too hard. Exactly, yeah. Just gentle heating where you do kill those live organisms and you don't get those benefits. Um, so add a side of fermented vegetables to your meal. It's a great way to incorporate that digestive. We've talked about kimchi and sauerkraut, so those are great to have on the side. And fermenting foods is really coming kind of like in vogue again along with canning. So we're going to be sampling some things that are produced locally by Firefly Kitchens that are really delicious and good to add on the side of your plate. And then another way, sourdough bread is going to be a fermented product. That's a really simple swap to kind of add some more fermented foods into your diet. And another thing I, I do want to mention is make sure if you're shopping for these foods for the probiotic benefit, make sure you're looking for ones that say they're fermented or traditionally made. A lot of times uh, pickles and sauerkraut, 
like will be commercially produced on a larger scale and they'll just add vinegar. It makes the process a lot faster and a lot cheaper, but unfortunately it does not um, you know, give us those probiotic benefits. It just gives us kind of a, an approximation of the flavor. So make sure you're looking at those. Okay, and that's what we have for you tonight. Thanks so much for your attention and we would love to answer any questions that we can. Yes. Um, what about digestive enzymes? I mean, I know you can like purchase them as tablets, and then mm -hmm. that's obviously not like a whole food form. But what are yeah. the pros and cons of taking them as opposed to some of those mm -hmm. options? Well, I mean, so a benefit would be that if you are someone, and there are people who physiologically don't really produce enough enzymes, um, you know, I can't really think of any cons to it necessarily. But there are a couple ways that you can do that through food. Um, and so generally choosing something like really sour or bitter is a great way to stimulate the flow of the bile and enzymes. So some things like that would be like really bitter greens. Um, there is that, that Swiss bitters. There's like a tincture you can take. Or you could just do sour foods naturally. Like um, good examples of that would be just to do lemon or lime juice. Just squeeze a couple tablespoons in a little bit of warm water or do like a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. And that's kind of like a more natural way to produce the enzymes a little bit more, get those flowing. Yeah, in the back. Yes, thinking about enzymes again, uh, I know available commercially there are animal and plant enzymes. Is there a big difference between the two, one preferred over the other? Do they have a different effect? You know, I am not totally sure what the difference between those would be. Okay. Um, I have to look at the products yeah, I'm not 100%, I'm sorry, but um, typically, you know, I think a lot of plant enzymes could be beneficial. Um, one thing, yeah, I'm not totally sure, but I will give you this plug, is that um, a great way to come in and have an hour-long appointment and ask all of these questions is right. to come to a nutrition appointment. Right, one more question, yeah. pancreatic uh, enzymes? Mm -hmm. Is there a danger in taking those long term, or do you know about? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Acid reflux is becoming very common in general. Suggestions from the parents. Yeah, absolutely. So with astro, uh, with reflux, <laughs> excuse me, it's basically um, the relaxation of the sphincter between the stomach and the esophagus, so the acid can come back up. So a couple things that you can do to help prevent that would be to eat smaller meals more frequently. Because having a bigger meal in your stomach can kind of you know, push up and have that acid reflux up your esophagus a little bit. Um, so smaller meals, an important thing is to stay upright after meals for at least a half hour. So don't eat and then go lay down and take a nap. Um, you know, stay upright sitting or walking or whatever. Um, so like, like coffee, yeah, it's right. pretty irritating as well. Mm -hmm. Avoiding acidic foods, yeah, definitely important. And there's um one like more like a remedy, like home remedy. I heard people use is to drink cabbage juice, and that's gonna help with like it's more like a cooling effect and it kind of bring down the acid reflux. Is that so commercially I think people just make it home. Just if you have a juicer or um, a blend that you store, you can get it, drink it. Yeah. And another thing too, with the tight. If you're wearing something tight, that can contribute to make like looser fitting clothes as well. Yeah. As well as um, identifying your own trigger foods. Most people have kind of trigger foods, so figuring out what those are is important. Yeah. As you get older, is it true that you your stomach acid decreases considerably? And that uh, maybe that's why you have problems with the digestion because of lack of stomach mm -hmm. acid. Yeah. 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 yeah, that is true, and that definitely does contribute to, to poorer so, digestion. So then the fermented foods, would that then add more help with that? Or? It will definitely help with it, absolutely. I mean, it, it doesn't completely attenuate those effects, but, um, but yeah, it will help with that. Uh, there seems to be a lot of um, uh, interest in apple cider vinegar being very helpful. What's the attributes of apple cider vinegar over other vinegars? 
you know, there's all kinds of them. I mean, everybody's got its own balsamic or wine vinegar. Some is clear and some aren't. But what is the benefits of the apple cider? Is there any? That's a great question. I mean, you read it everywhere about how helpful <laughs> it is, but nobody says what it is that it's, it yeah. makes it helpful. Yeah, right, and why it's better than other yeah. vinegars. I think that, that, uh, the pectin, the pectin is what I've heard. That's what I've always heard is why the difference between the apple cider vinegar and other vinegars is that the apple cider vinegar has the pectin and the pectin is good for digestion. Mm -hmm. Learn something new too. Yeah. yeah, it's possible. Yeah. So. You might check out the Bragg's website. You know, they, they, they uh, produce the apple cider vinegar. Yeah, I know when they advertise it, it's very helpful, and I look yeah, all that they stuff. Don't tell you. They don't tell you why. <laughs> that might be a good resource. But, but I know in some of the diabetes literature and, and stuff, when they talk about the apple cider vinegar, it's the, it's the reason why it's the apple cider vinegar is the pectin. So. In the red right there. Yeah, hi, I've been treating a real severe case of eczema all over my body with a wonderful uh, uh, product called Phytostan that you have here in your dispensary that's a broad spectrum probiotic that has many, many different strains and also mm -hmm. some enzyme ingredients and it's been very effective. But I'm kind of mixing it up now and doing my own thing and go back on it if I need it. But uh, the, uh, uh, the information online is somewhat confusing about this. Uh, some of them say no, sauerkraut, you know, kombucha is not good. It's got a sugar content you want to avoid if you're avoiding sugar, wheat, and dairy, which I'm also doing. Um, and then some recommend prebiotics in the mix, and I don't know anything about them. So uh, what are, uh, you know, if you're trying to avoid it, you know, uh, to avoid anything that might um, uh, compromise the effectiveness of the probiotics, what are the prebiotics and what are some of the things not to eat or not to use while you're, could you expand on that part? Yeah, I can definitely tackle the prebiotics question. So prebiotics are a type of, um, a, well, it's an oligosaccharide, it's a starch, um, and basically it's not digested by our body. So what happens is it moves into the colon intact, um, and intact sounds scary, but it's just several molecules. Um, and then they ferment and form bacteria there in your colon. So it's basically like, um, oh, what's a good way to think of it? Like a probiotic in waiting. Right? Or it's kind of like the way I think about it. So like prebiotics, like probiotics need prebiotics and they exist simultaneously. Prebiotics. And they use them yeah, as they like nourish. fuel. <laughs> they eat, probiotics eat the prebiotics. prebiotics. Right, right, yeah, they yeah. nourish so. yeah. And did you also have the question about like what causes the decrease of the uh, bacteria and what you're um, calling? Of the good drug, of the good probiotic. What, what should one avoid if you're trying to maintain a good uh, natural level of yeah, so like, probiotics? Uh, Susan was mentioned earlier about um, alcohol and high sugar stuff, caffeine, those are going to be causing the less. Um, friendly environment for your probiotics. So those are the common things that you might want to avoid if you are trying to maintain the natural um, level of, the, of your uh, gut bacteria. And while they're necessary, sometimes antibiotics will also wipe out a large percentage of your yeah. good bacteria. And I think we'll, we'll break here for just a quick second. And <coughs> I just want to say that we're sampling a bunch of different things. So we have fermented vegetables, kefir, kombucha, um, so feel free to help yourselves. We're going to stand here and continue to answer questions. But if you would like to start sampling, we just want to make sure everyone has a chance.